During the war between good and evil, the spectator is nearly always drawn by the triumph of evil. The most violent crime is that which attracts the most morbid interest. As a murderer is rare, a being apart, it is natural that all interest is focused on him. Anyone can, in fact, become a victim. Crime can fall ominously, both on the innocent and the guilty, rich or poor, with the impartiality of an air raid. The murderer, whilst committing an unpremeditated crime, normally leaves behind some trace in the excitement of the moment. It is then always interesting to follow up the leads and consequently listen to all those clichés about love, disloyalty, jealousy, children, broken dreams, the hammer or the knife used. Listen to all of this and to think that we could also have been the victims, let alone the murderers. You got to feed your soul, not your habit. You got to free your soul, not a habit. You got to be yourself, you got to be it. You got to see yourself.
Jelisa. Friends and lovers, beating hearts, all of us caught in this joyful moment. Because all the world loves lovers. All the world loves people in love. Mm. Isn't it true? This is how everything began, with a journey, the journey of a film crew from Rome to London on a warm summer day. friends come together. We went into the garden where tea and a carpet were laid. One evening in January 1994, which is today four and a half years ago, Two students from financially privileged backgrounds decided to commit the perfect crime, to select a person unknown to them and to kill them. They travel into London by coach and a few hours later, at a giveaway sign near Bayswater Underground Station, they meet their victim. They get into his car, force him to stop some way ahead and they kill him. After the crime, they return to their lives as students. Some 10 months later, they're convicted for life in prison. We've come together to make this film about our curiosity about this case. For legal reasons, we are not allowed to mention the names of the killers, but we will be clear about the name of the victim, Mohammed El Sayed.
So, Luca and I having had endless conversations about murder, four years ago became independently and in different countries fascinated by this case. Something about the level of coldness that the murderers aspired to caught our imagination. And now we are in Collindale Newspaper Library. That is the place in which in London you can find out everything you want about papers. And Fabrizia is helping us to research. So I'll go and see if she's getting on. How are you doing? Maybe something. Mm -hmm. Here. Under criminal sentences. A man who raped and sexually abused his 13 month old daughter for three hours while drunk, jailed for life. Schizophrenia who attacked her housewife in London with a baseball bat. Here we are. Okay, we have these two teenage students convicted of murdering London chef Mohammed El Sayed, jailed for life on November the 8th by London's Old Bailey Court. Yes, El Sayed Mohammed. Two Oxford teenagers charged with murder of men stabbed to death in West London last month. It was a fascinating trial. It was probably the first big trial I did. And when the prosecution opened and they started explaining that two boys who had everything going for them uh, went to good schools, had stable backgrounds, and ended up murdering someone after they fantasized that they were in the SAS. Well, you know, the newspaper, that's just sensational. Nothing really fitted with the crime that they committed. Um, they were two very ordinary boys, and yet the crime that this murder was so horrific that it just didn't add up. We weren't talking about someone who was definitely going to kill someone. I think it was more about two people coming together two chemicals, which on their own are completely harmless, but when you mix them together, they become something quite explosive, and that's what happened here. Sean, this was your first big assignment. How did it affect you? It was a sense of waste with the whole story, which had the biggest impact on me, because it, it needn't have happened. And sadly, as a journalist, sometimes you're working on a terrible story, but it's exciting, mm. um, and it's fascinating, and it's the story of the moment, mm. and you're at the centre of it, and so you it's like you can forget sometimes that there are other issues here and everyone gets very excited when a tragic story or a great story happens because you know it's going to make great newspaper copy. Right up until the moment that he was taken down into the cells, one of the boys still believed he was in the SAS or in the parachute regiment or whatever and he still believed that right up until that very moment before he got taken down into the cells to start his life sentence was that the SAS were going to come crashing in through the window and they were going to rescue him. And then you realised how deep into this fantasy these two had actually become. A vicious way to come of age. Leaving aside his stabbing of a complete stranger in a parked car last January for which he's just started a life sentence, nameless murderer number one was always a very polite young man. He liked to be liked. The other, the beloved friend he made when retaking A-levels and now serving a similar sentence, was quite different. He would whistle loudly at the back of the bus to irritate other passengers. He wore a Chicago White Sox baseball cap, socks that he had customised with a pen to read sex. He used to hide behind mirrored sunglasses. In shops, he would lean over and glare at assistants. These details about these murderers were so hungry for them. Whether we're hungry for them to make them feel more exotic or whether we're hungry for them to make them feel more banal, I don't know. But it seems to me that maybe we should be looking not so much for details of what they were, but details of what they were not, because they lack something. They lack the thing that stops most of us from doing what they do, killing another person, when all of us could do it any minute of any day. This could be your last. We're here talking with Jerry Alford, who was the investigative officer on this case, and Richard South, who was part of the investigative team. So, Jerry, why are we here? Where are we? Well, we're in the middle of King's Cross, yeah. and we're here because this is where the boys came um, immediately before they committed the murder. What, they came on the tube from... They certainly I think they came by coach Victoria, to Victoria, that, that, and then right, they came by underground right. here. That's right, coach to Victoria, and then the underground here. And what did they do while they were here? Well, they, they walked around looking, they said, for a pimp or a drug dealer uh -huh. to kill, and they went into a pub with the Flying Scotsman, yeah. and even asked a... Uh, a prostitute, whether she knew where they could find a pimp, which was amazing. 
Wasn't that quite a dangerous thing to do, walk around King's Cross and... Certainly, uh... if, you're, if you don't know the area. Highly dangerous, really. Yeah. As I understand it, when Mohammed El Sayed was found murdered, you had nothing to go on. That's right. We literally had nothing to go on at all. Um, we, he was found in his car, and the only things that we found were missing were his spectacles and his glasses, and the car keys. Car keys. Um, and we just had nothing to go on at all. And how long was it before unnamed murderer number one confessed? It was about a month. It was almost exactly a month. So we, we had you know, a whole month of, of going down lots of different avenues, lots of different um, areas, which obviously eventually were completely the wrong ones. And how did the confession work? Tell us about that interview. Shocking. Yeah, it's, it was an amazing experience. I, I can honestly describe it as a, a sort of a, a life-changing experience, really, because I, I literally asked him one question, tell me what happened, um, and we couldn't stop him. I've never spoken to anybody in all my years as a police officer who has made such a lengthy admission to such serious crimes, ever. And what was his attitude when he was confessing? Coldness, total... Mm. Coldness. There was no emotion in the speech. Uh, very matter of fact. It was as though he was, he was just reading off a script. Mm. So, Jerry and Richard, I want to ask you: This case was four and a half years ago. What was it like to be approached to take part in this film? And why are you here talking to us? I'm here because it really was, uh, for me anyway, a, a real watershed. Um, something completely different. And dealing with someone so completely out of the ordinary, I really think it's a story that has to be told. So what's it like being filmed? Um, different, <laughs> different. I, I've been interviewed on the television once or twice before, about this case, in fact. Um, but um, I don't think you ever get used to it. <laughs> so what's different this time? Have you ever walked along the street with somebody Absol walking backwards? Absolutely not. No. Your no, it's always been stage managed before. And uh, what are the most annoying bits about filming? What are the nicest bits? The nicest bits, of course, are meeting people like you. Uh, <laughs> uh, the annoying bits are uh, having makeup put on your face. <laughs> <laughs> you insisted on so much makeup, Richard. You insisted on very long eyelashes. Bayswater Station. This is Queensway, this whole road. Yes. And this is where the boys came on the yeah. underground when they from King's Cross. And this is the Golden Horseshoe Casino, which is where Mohammed was spent his last night, the night of the murder. So let's go. Should we go to Bishop's Bridge Road now? Okay, look right. <laughs> look right. Speak Italian. <laughs> you look right. Tilda. How was the meeting with Jerry Orford today? It was wonderful, and um, also we had Richard South, yes. who was one of the investigative team. They were so generous. They were so interested still in the case. Yes. Uh, what about uh, Jamie's confession? Do you do you remember? Yeah, that was the thing that really impressed them about the whole case. Jerry asked him one question: Where do you want to start? And um, he started to tell him the story of his life. At the very beginning, he started with the sentence. Well, I spent most of my life in a boarding school and continued for, for, for hours. And these two police officers, extremely experienced policemen, were really shocked by this. Where we are? Well, we're coming to the end of Queensway, and this is the corner with Bishop's Bridge Road. This is the road on which Mohammed's body was found in his car. And uh, this is the route they were taking where they were looking for somebody to murder. I don't know how you feel about this, but the more we go on this quest of ours and the more details we seem to find, the sadder I get. It's as if none of these details are relevant, as if nothing 
matters at all. It doesn't matter where it was that this murder was committed. It doesn't matter where Mohammed was coming from. I mean, here we are. This is the corner of Porchester Terrace North. And this is the giveaway sign where Mohammed's car stopped. And this is where murderer number one got into his car. And, and yet it's exactly like any other corner or in any other street in London. I mean, just, I feel so defeated by it. I don't know, do you feel so? Yes, yeah, yes. Love. Happiness. Passion. Loss. Regret. Sorrow. Pain. Pain. You know, they took Mohammed's glasses away. Give you my money, my money, my money. Oh, no, 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 Doctor! All right! Here, here, here! here. Yeah. It's okay. I'm, I'm doing, yeah. I'm doing exactly okay. what you say, okay? Okay! okay. okay. I'm part of you, do it! I'm not in the engine! Okay, you can no. have my wallet, it's in the pocket now! Billy! Okay. Fight now! Billy! Okay. Okay. Right now! Billy! Okay. Right now! Okay. Right now. Right now. Right now. Right now. okay, so can you get okay. in the car? Yeah. yeah. You get in the car first. Okay. Yeah. I'm here. Okay. All right. So you're in the car. Okay. Your first stab was in the throat. Yeah. You're grabbing my back. Yeah. And then, <coughs> yeah, and then right through with it. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Cut. The chest. Yes. Heart. But it's the fascination of it rather than the hatred. Yeah. You don't know this guy. And then <coughs> right in my head. Ah. Are you comfortable, Tilda? Mm -mm -mm. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What have this? This is our beds. Can you help me, please? Yes. You take them, you put in water, mm -hmm. and you squeeze them, and you pass. Right. Okay? Right. And you struggle, and then come Yeah! I It's ready. Be careful here. Okay. Great. Okay. Thank you, Tilda. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, my son. Thank you, Fabrizio. Thanks, Fernanda. It's a pleasure. 
here on the Friday night, seven o'clock, okay, kissed the boys and me goodbye, but he'd done a fish supper before that, he went out, I never forget that, and uh, he said bye, see you later, kissed the boys goodbye and me and went, and I thought oh, I'll see him later on, but I never did, that was the last time I saw him on the Friday, hmm. I got the knock on the door, yeah, from the police, and they said that um, they had some very tragic and bad news for me. And I couldn't take it all in when they told me. And they just said that I'm afraid to tell you that your husband's been stabbed or killed. I don't know what they actually said, those words, but they said he'd been killed. Mm. So the boys went upstairs? Yeah. So then they fell asleep up there. And that mm. So the next time, and the day after, and that, I just gradually told them. Can you remember how you started to tell them a thing like that? Uh, first of all, I said, Daddy's gone to heaven, which every parent or mum says to when they've lost someone, the easy way out is just say go to heaven, which I did. But then gradually I, I told them that Daddy was in the car and these two nasty boys came along. One jumped in, told your Daddy to drive around and stab him to death. And how old are the boys? Six and a half. Six and a half two and, and, two and, and, half. and a half. And then, as I understand it, the police then came to you when you were in Egypt? After the funeral, yeah, they came I was staying there, yeah. They said that we've caught a boy, I can't remember if they said boys or boy, with connection with the murder of my husband. Mm. And when they said that to me, I felt relieved. Mm. And I, and very relieved. You don't go around killing someone because you mm. would do it for kicks, that's what they mm. do, they just done it for kicks. Mm. That makes me mad. It was in the papers, kicks, 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 they did it for mm. kicks. Mm. Enjoyment to them. Mm. And he went out and planned it, that's what the other, I got all. Oh. We're going to kill a pimp. They wanted a pimp first of all, because they couldn't find a pimp. So. Why did they want a pimp? And the day of the sentence, well, that was really, that was that was relief and ha not happy, but relieved at the same time that it was all over and they're going to go to jail and that's that's it. The children kept me going, believe it or not. They pulled me through. The children were lifting me up all the time saying things to me to help me. They helped me. Mm. If I didn't have the children talking to me and helping me through it and we helping each other, I wouldn't be here now talking to you. Really? That is true. The boys are very good. And also he's a good father yeah. to the boys, a good husband mm. to me. and A good cook? Yeah, a good cook. <laughs> it's very good. Yeah. What's it like not having to cook? I miss that. <laughs> I do it myself. Well, plain food, man. Anything. Anything in a pan. <laughs> for the boys and me, but I miss all that. What was Mohammed's best fit sort of pièce de resistance? Italian. 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 He worked in an Italian restaurant. Very good. Really? Yeah, I loved his food, yeah. Really? What was his sort of... Pasta. Pasta. 
Which oh which sauce? Oh was his God, favorite? he can't remind me of the sauces. I so many sauces. <laughs> he even made up his own sauces. What was his best sauce? Oh, he made a creamy mushroom one with herbs and spices, and I can never remember what it was. It was lovely. You just put it on the pasta. He made the pasta, and that oh, I can I, I feel better that I'm talking about it again. It's like a counselling session mm. where people are helping me, talking to me like you are. Mm. It's bringing it up again. Mm. It feels hurtful and sad and everything, but it feels better that I'm talking about it to you and that it will go to Italy, another country, mm. to be recognised. Because mm. I think here they've forgotten about it in England. One more murder to them, go on, next one. Mm. That's the feeling I get. Mm. So, and what do you think about your life now? It's, uh, it's, it's getting better. I can't say it's not getting better, because it is getting better. But it's hard at times, you know, when I'm taking here and taking them there. Yeah. I can't do more. I can't do more to them. OK. Mm. Thank you, Sue. Mm. Thank you very much. That's all I know, Mum. Should we make a cake now? And see the babies? Oh, yeah. So I said the next step is to get, take a photo and take to the police station, which is what they did, and mm. the events happened from there. Mm. So when the police arrived, can you remember what you were doing? When I'm just sitting here watching telly with the boys. Yeah. So the boys were in, in yeah. the room when the they police came there. in? Yeah, yeah. So the boys went upstairs? Yeah. Did the boys wonder? So yeah. after the police had gone, you were on your own? No, I had my sister and my brother. Yes, oh, right, right. The boys had gone up to bed. Yeah. Well, I hadn't gone up, I just ran upstairs because I wonder what was right. going on because they saw me crying and that. So. Ah. Ah. Mm. Then they fell asleep up there and that, and they were next to her. And the day after and that, I just gradually told them. Paolo, Emiliana wants to know if this color is right for the scene of tomorrow. What do you see? A dark cave. It looks like a little mouse. An island. A butterfly. Looks like lines of cocaine. Metal. The wind. Three aliens. Wave. Underground. Space. And what do you see, Tilda? I see this. Christmas 1993. Billy had told Happy that he would be spending his holidays in Iraq with the SAS. The mission? To destroy the evil empire of Saddam. Happy gave him a commando knife as a Christmas present. But that Christmas, Billy wasn't in Iraq. That Christmas, Billy was at home. And that Christmas, Billy was drowning. Good night, Sam. Good night. Good night, Mom. Hold my hand. Christmas, Billy.
It's always very difficult to say what you feel when you're in court looking at the accused because that's the first time you've ever seen them in most instances. And they often look very ordinary people. And these guys just look like two ordinary sixth former stroke young university people. Perfectly normal, didn't look anything out of the ordinary at all. But when you looked at them, when you knew what they'd done and why they'd done it or why it was said they'd done it, then you look at them and you think, well, are these guys really evil? Is there something inside their brain which has gone berserk? The murderer said the first thing that he said, having stuck the knife in Mohammed's throat, was, Jesus, there's so much blood. As if he wasn't expecting there to be so much blood, or in fact, any blood at all, as if somehow he hadn't expected this to be a living human being but he regarded this person basically as an experimental model. And then when it reacted like a human being, then perhaps it does show he's got some humanity after all. It's absolutely impossible to say how long he suffered because he could have died very, very quickly or he may have taken a little bit longer to die. I would suspect that the neck injury caused him an awful lot of pain and discomfort. But once he'd felt started to bleed, from his chest wounds, then I would suspect that he would die fairly quickly. We're in here. OK, we're in here. We're talking to Dr. Hill, who was the pathologist who worked on the case of Mohammed El Sayed's death. Did you remember this case uh, when you were asked to take part in this film? Yes, I did remember it largely because of the peculiar circumstances of two schoolboys coming down to select a man to kill. I went to where the car was in the side street and I looked at the body inside the motor car mm. and I then had a careful look around the motor car. And then the body was taken to the mortuary. Yeah. You examine the body with the clothing on and you take the clothing off, looking at it carefully as you do so, and then you do what we call the dissection, the internal examination to find mm -hmm. out where the wounds have gone to. So you don't actually uh, know what actually went on in the car from the post-mortem, no? No, there are many ideas that you can put forward mm -hmm. as to what happened. You have to remember that a stab wound can be caused in any one of a number of different ways. I could stab you by putting the knife in that way, uh -huh. holding my hand that way, or I could stab you holding that way. Could you tell if uh, um, the victim was held by the head? The appearances of the neck injury would suggest that he would have, must have had his head pulled back mm -hmm. so that somebody could put the knife into the neck probably from behind because in the confines of a motor car it would be very very difficult to achieve that injury mm -hmm. in any other way mm. not impossible but mm. difficult if you put a knife in somebody's throat it depends exactly what you hit how yeah. they die in this victim well all that happened was he got a knife in his neck which cut into his voice box and did some damage and caused a little bit of bleeding but it didn't kill him mm. dr hill this is fernanda perez she's our makeup artist and um Part, a very important part of our film is a reconstruction of the murder of Mohammed El Sayed. And we have some details over here that she wanted to ask your advice about. So this is Andrew's neck and yep. the cast's neck. Uh, can you mark for us here, where was the wound of Mr... It was roughly there, across the front of the neck. Mm -hmm. It was quite a big wound, actually. It was uh, about that length, and it was gaping a little bit. The injury to the heart itself wasn't that very big again, but then you had a couple of injuries to that. And again, you don't need a very big hole in the heart to cause bleeding mm -hmm. and for the person to bleed to death. You can do it just by pressing firmly on a sharp knife, and it will go through, just like a knife through butter. And did he indeed hit Mohammed El Sayed's heart with one? Oh, yes. Really? Yes. And as a, a specialist, what annoys you most in most filmed reconstructions of murders? I think probably the thing that gets us most across is the fact that drama always tries to make the time of death very, very finite. Mm. And they say, oh, somebody died at quarter past eight in the evening, when I know that there's no way you can do it that accurately. Mm. If I could, it would make my life a lot easier than it is. <laughs> Glasses on or off? 
Oh. You know I'm blind. Yes, but the shadows on okay. your face are okay. not very good. So, we are at our geography lesson now. Unnamed murderer number one and unnamed murderer number two mm -hmm. come to London by coach from Oxford. They get off at Victoria Coach Station and they make their way to King's Cross. King's Cross. Okay. They were looking for their victim, which would be a pimp or a drug dealer. After walking around for a while, they entered a pub here. Which was a gay pub, yeah? And then what happened was they went on the Caledonian Road, which is uh, this rather charming place, the Flying Scotsman. Where but you've been? I've been there, and, it's, and I was there about six o'clock at night, mm. and it was very rough then, <laughs> very frightening, so... And they're there at about ten o'clock. And they talked to a stripper. Zoe. Sorry. And I think she persuaded them not to look around King's Cross, because then what happened was... Mm. They got back on the tube. Right, so and they're heading for where, do we think? Maybe they were heading towards Victoria. Back to the coach station, back no there. murder. Yeah. Given up. And somewhere around this point, uh, number two convinced number one to get off at Bayswater. Uh -huh. Which he knew. That's right. He knew the area. And uh, to continue with the murder plan. Okay, so they get off at Bayswater, which is here. Which you'll notice is very, very near to the Golden Horseshoe Casino, which, interestingly enough, they had visited about two months previously. Posing as CID officers. On some SAS-inspired exercise to show initiative. So, the boys have gone along here up Bishopsbridge Road and they're hanging around here waiting for a car. On the corner of Orchester Terrace, sitting on a wall. Right, sitting on a wall here. Yeah. And they decide to stop the first car that comes along. Or... Mohammed El Sayed leaves the Golden Horseshoe Casino with, with a, a friend, friend. Yeah. takes a friend home, mm -hmm. who lives up here somewhere. Mm -hmm. Friend invites him in for a cup of tea. Incidentally, mm -hmm. this cup of tea is yours. Okay. It has two sugars Sorry. in it. I meant to say that yes. earlier. Thank you. Mohammed declines this cup of tea, unfortunately for him. Mm -hmm. Gets back into his car, hence the unlocked doors. Right. Comes right, he's on his way home, comes along here, and stops at the giveaway sign, which is where unnamed murderer number one finds him, Jumps, jumps in. in the car, asks him to turn left into Bishopsbridge Road. Right. And... Um, that's where they do the deed. That's where they do the deed. In front of the big white houses. The big white houses. So having killed Mohammed El Sayed, they went home via Bayswater station, underground station, to the bus. At Victoria. And where is the bus? What do you mean? <laughs> Where's the bus? Can you see it? Where is the bus? No, but Robertino said that the bus was going to be here. Robertino, where is the bus? It's here. Where? Here. Where? And give me that. Can you There you go. Yeah, give me that one. and uh, unnamed murderer number one opens his birthday cards. Because today's his birthday, of course. How very nice for him. It all slots together. It's charming, isn't it? How charming. <laughs> Stay calm. Don't move. Just go around the corner. You try. Come on! Stop here.
Fabrizia, Fabrizia. Fabrizia, wake up. Fabrizia. What's happening? Come on, it's the trial scene. Oh. <laughs> what are you doing now? I'm looking for my pants. Come on, everybody's waiting for you. Oh. Don't wear it. Hurry up, the judge doesn't like to wait. Hurry up. Is this something you should tell me about Andrew? Huh? Let's go. Okay, let's go. Vieni! She's so lovely. Sorry, Tim. Sorry, everybody. I'm late. It's the trial scene, isn't it? Mm-hmm. You're right. You ready? The trial for the murder of Mohammed El Sayed, Egyptian citizen, born in Cairo, 44 years of age at his death, lasted 17 days in the autumn of 1994. Mohammed's wife, my wife, only attended the first and last days of the trial. I was holding a rosary in my hand, looking up at the public gallery. I was in my dark suit with my usual elegance. What's the hall like, Tilda? Well, the furniture in the trial hall is certainly dark and massive. It gives the impression of stability. No glass, no windows. There is a closed smell that makes one think of a church. The judge certainly commands respect and a terrible deference. And I wouldn't be surprised if his eyes were a terrible weight upon happy and Billy. And the eyes of the jury. The public in the gallery, the families of the defendants, their legal representatives, all there. The defense of the two accused was diminished responsibility for unnamed murderer number one and innocence for unnamed murderer number two. In fact, I wasn't in the car. I was outside it. And I thought he was trying to rob Mohammed. He was stabbing me here, 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 and here. But I wasn't in the car. I thought he had been punching him. So why didn't you run and report him? I was afraid of him. The jury smiled at all this. 
During the 17 days, witnesses were heard and everything proceeded as is usual. The experts gave their opinions, the pathologists' cruel photographs were put on show to the horror of those present. And at last, after a good part of the trial, the defendants were heard. What happened on the night of January 14th, 1994? Billy and I had a signal. If I called him and he did not reply, this meant that I could strike. And so I said, Bill. And Billy didn't reply. And I kept on calling him, Bill, Billy. And he still did not reply. And so I began. And how? Like this, and this, and this, and That's enough. Dildo, go on. After the jury's debate, with the judge's notes of guidance, they adjourned to decide. It took five hours. Found guilty with eight jury votes against two, in favor of mental infirmity. Found guilty unanimously. You created a world in which you were both playing out your fantasies. And it developed into an obsession with killing and death. And that obsession led to the brutal and senseless slaughter of a complete stranger who just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. We can be murdered, we can be mutilated by vehicles, we can be drowned, disemboweled by a bull. We can kill ourselves because we're tired of living, but not even in death will they leave us alone. At 11 in the morning of the 8th of November, 1994, Mohammed El Sayed officially was murdered. him his glasses and he had no voice box left a lot of people keep stopping and looking as filming here a lot more people stopped to watch us filming this than noticed Mohammed in his car all that night Come around the tree. Just follow me along here. So we've got some details right. We're in the same road as he was in when he was found. This is Bishop's Bridge Road in West London. These are the flats, the big white houses that unnamed murderer number one referred to in his statement. This is the exact spot up here where he was found. We've got a similar car to the car in which he was found. But we've got way too much blood. It's way too theatrical. It's hard to imagine quite how unspectacular this murder was. I've seen the photographs, and it's nothing like this.
so easy to commit a murder like this. I mean, I could jump into any of these cars and do this very same thing. So simple and so banal. So this is the place. This is the very spot. You know, this is it. meaningless. It doesn't mean anything. And a man was killed in the most horrible and meaningless way. It could be anywhere. It doesn't have to be here. Welcome to the show. Mohammed El Sayed was spending his night out with a couple of friends in a ballroom. He was a young man with a strange, volatile face. Courage, shyness and modesty were all that he possessed. That special night, in that ballroom, he met the love of his life. Have the pleasure of this dance. Sure. Billy was a loner. At the beginning of the 90s, he was deep in a world of fantasies and poems he used to write. Your father and I have decided that you will go to extra classes to catch up. <laughs> Don't worry about paying attention. You'll never do. Visions of bodies at rest and in motion car crashes, and dead sisters who never existed.
Billy was a tough guy. Billy was a man of discipline and order. Where was Billy? In another place, at the same time, a movie struck Happy's imagination. The Silence of the Lambs. Happy, as Jamie Gum did, desiring the others, only desired himself. Meeting Billy, he met his real-life Hannibal Lecter. Was he a real-life Clarice? His thoughts were forbidden to everybody, particularly to himself. And Mohammed and Sue were married. With his faraway glance lost in the horizon, Billy was waiting for his sweetheart. He will remember this moment always. He gave her one of his poems. His song is like a heart to death. Tell me about the war you want to fight. It's you. Where have you been all this time? Your hair. Do you like the color? It's beautiful. Your eyes. They are so sad. That girl knew everything about him. Billy gives orders. Happy obeys, longing for his appreciation.
looking for contact. These are for you. Thank you. How did it go? <sighs> Very tiring. It's a beautiful place. I'll take you there one day. Can't wait. Why you're looking at me? Because I don't want to lose you. You won't. Every day I wake up, and I thank God I found you. You're the most beautiful thing that's ever happened to me. Do you know that? Do you know that? I dreamt that I woke up and something terrible had happened to you. It was like somebody was waiting to take you away from me. There's nobody there. Don't worry, baby. Don't worry. Welcome. To the show. How you come and go tonight. Don't let the bed bugs bite tonight. Nothing is true. Everything is permitted. Get ready for the show. A one. Two, three, magic, crazy, here's Zoe. Pardon my asking, are you ready for this? Admission is not free. A broken heart's the fee. Everything is permitted. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the show.
were very good up there. What did you like best? Well, um, the way you move, yeah. I, I, I like it when you took off your wig. You realized that it wasn't my hair? Actually, no. You, you were red as a pint of beer. Well, I'm a natural blonde, as I showed you. You're not talking? I like to listen. That's good, I suppose. Now, where are you going to carry on this evening with all this music in the air? We have a plan. Don't tell me. I know it's got to stay a secret. Just one thing we can tell you, though. We are looking for a pimp or a drug dealer. Do you know how we can recognize them? How are they dressed? What eyes you have? What sad eyes? That night, Happy and Billy, the two boys, walked around, crossed the city, traveled paths, and finally reached that corner. Happy desperately looked for contact. Billy later claimed never to have been in that car that night. Mohammed came home early that afternoon. He ate with Susan and the children. He put on his raincoat, took his wallet, the house keys and the car keys. He kissed his wife and his children. He picked up a friend and they spent the night in a casino. He drove his friend back home, refused a cup of tea, Mrs. El Sayed? Yes? We have some tragic news for you. The body of your husband. The light inside me is dying. My soul is lying halfway to hell. Nothing seems worth living for. I am not a boy. I am a machine that lives. No feelings. No feelings.
take 32, 1, 3. And action. Come to me. He's Andrea, she's Paula, he's nice our continuity supervisor. And he's Walter, he's the editor of the film. She's Amidiana, she's a friend of mine, she's, nice she's, she's our makeup artist. This is Xavier, she's hey, Ola. Yeah. This is Ola.
Fabio, he's our photographer. Hi. 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 He's Massimo, he's our hair stylist. And he's Robertino, our Hi. production designer. Hello, guys. Hi. Here's Dina. Honor and Sylvia. She's Fabrizia. Hi. Yes. 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 He's Claudio. Hi, Claudio. He's Paolo, Hi. better known as Paulino. Okay. And you know him. I know him. Hello, and to the horror of those present, and at last, after a good part of the trial, the defendants were heard. What happened on the night of January 14th, 1994? Cut. <laughs> <laughs> During the 17 days, we <laughs> so sorry. that perf otherwise perfectly ordinary people 